if it is important for me to prepare for a bike ride, it is much more important for you to prepare for your future, both this life and the eternities. My young friends, it's a humbling experience for me to be here once again on the beautiful campus of Brigham Young University and to be with President and Sister Bateman and other administrators, faculty, and you wonderful members of the student body. Most of you are still a little too young to appreciate how fast time passes. You know, the older I get, the quicker it passes, and I, I'm not sure if it's a sign of old age or just the pace of my lifestyle. The story is told of two very elderly ladies who were enjoying the sunshine on a park bench in Miami. They had been meeting at the same park every day for more than 12 years, chatting and enjoying each other's company. One day, the younger of the two ladies turned to the other and said, please don't be angry with me, dear. After all these years, what is your name? I'm trying to remember, but I just can't. The older friend start, stared at her and looking very distressed and said nothing for two full minutes. And finally, with tearful eyes, said, how soon do you have to know? <laughs> well, I haven't reached that stage in life yet. But I must confess that when I received this assignment, I thought I've just had that opportunity. And yet when I looked at my journal, I found that two years had passed since I was last given the opportunity to speak at, on this great campus. Yes, how quickly time passes. <clears throat> Ten years ago this October, while speaking in general priesthood meeting, I shared the following experience, quote, one day my son Ben came to me and said, Dad, we're going to hold our family reunion at Flaming Gorge Recreation Area, a distance of 220 miles east of Salt Lake City. Why don't you, myself, and any of the boys in our family that would like to leave a few days early, ride our bikes to Flaming Gorge and meet the rest of the family there? I said, that sounds great, but we only have one motorcycle. Ben said, no, Dad, you don't understand. I mean pedal bicycles. I thought he was kidding. He said, I will outline and prepare a training schedule for us. <clears throat> we'll get up early Saturday mornings, and for three or four hours, we'll go out and ride over the courses that I will outline so that when the time comes, we will be prepared to go. I said, OK, not really knowing what I was in for. I didn't own a bicycle and knew I would have to use my daughter's old heavy 10-speed bicycle <clears throat> with what seemed like bent wheels and a seat that was terribly, terribly hard. I also knew that getting up early Saturday mornings was not one of my favorite things. But knowing that some of my sons wanted me to go with them, I said, OK. As the time for training and preparation came, I found all kinds of excuses not to go on the training rides. However, one Saturday morning, I did ride with him up to the top of Parley's Canyon and back. It was hard, but I thought I would be okay. Little did I know. The time, the time came for the trip. I joined my boys the second day of the trip as I had meetings the first day. The journey the second day took us from Heber City to Roosevelt, approximately 100 miles. As we checked into the motel that evening, I called my wife at home and told her I had never hurt so badly in my whole life. Every muscle, bone, from the top of my head to my feet hurt. I implored her, when you come tomorrow with the rest of the family, please bring all the ointment and lotion you can find. She said, honey, you sound terrible. I told her, I look and feel worse than I sound. The next day, I hated to see the dawn come, knowing what it would be like to sit on that hard seat and pedal all day once again in order to reach our destination, <clears throat> especially the stretch from Vernal to Flaming Gorge, which would include approximately 36 plus miles with grades up to 9% and 90 degree plus temperatures. Needless to say, for me, the whole trip was a very trying and arduous task. But for my sons, who spend a lot of time waiting at the top of the hills for their slow, unprepared dad, it was exciting, fun, and rewarding. 
that evening as we arrived at our destination, I came to an easy but profound recognition of how poorly prepared I was for what should have been a great, <clears throat> great experience with my sons, but was not because I did not take the time to prepare properly. I resolved that night that I would never again be that unprepared. I went home, I bought bicycles for myself and my two youngest sons, and started training and preparing so that by the time the next summer came, my sons and I could ride our bikes to the Lake Powell a distance of 300 miles, which we did. The next year we rode to St. George, and every year thereafter we rode our bikes to the Lake Powell until our mission assignment some years later." End quote. With a call to serve as a mission president 12 years ago, and this subsequent call, which took my wife and me to several international assignments, the long bike rides had to be put on hold for a period of time. I did, however, take my bicycle with me wherever my assignments were in hopes that I would be able to find time to ride occasionally in order to be prepared so if the opportunity for a long ride ever came again, I would be able to do it. That opportunity came once again this last fall when I was given permission to take a few days away from the office. At the invitation of that same son who years ago suggested we ride to Flaming Gorge, <clears throat> and now joined by another son and our only daughter, we flew with our bikes to Bozeman, Montana, and proceeded to ride to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. At my age, preparation continues to be very, very important in order to survive such a ride. <clears throat> the prophet Amulek testified, this life is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Yea, behold, the day of this life is the day for men to perform their labors. If it is important, if it is important for me to prepare for a bike ride, it is much more important for you to prepare for your future, both this life and the eternities. As I contemplate the significance of what you are doing in this great institution of learning, I think of the words of President Thomas S. Monson, preparation for life's opportunities and responsibilities has never been more vital. We live in a changing society. Intense competition is a part of life. The role of husband, father, grandfather, provider, and protector is vastly different from what it was a generation ago. Preparation is not a matter of perhaps or maybe, it is a mandate. The old phrase, ignorance is bliss, is for, forever gone. <clears throat> Preparation precedes performance. Close quote. Did you catch the phrase, it is a mandate? <clears throat> the dictionary defines the word mandate as an official or an authoritative instruction or command. Let me repeat that an official or an authoritative instruction or command. An interesting choice of words then from a prophet, seer, and revelator, isn't it? As we consider our preparation for life, remember, us, remember that the Lord counsels us as we read in Hosea, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And then in the Doctrine and Covenants, seek ye out of the best books words of wisdom, Seek learning even by study and also by faith. <clears throat> but remember, my young friends, the more knowledge and learning we obtain and the more success we gain, the more humility we need. Recognizing that the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth, and that light and truth forsake the evil one, we can immediately see that there are many benefits. One such benefit is that of having light and truth in our lives. <clears throat> you young people face an exciting and yet daunting future of ever-changing career opportunities as job markets come and go within the pressures of a global economy. Whereas once a career, a career decision meant a job for life in a given vocation, nowadays you may have to make up to three or four major career changes during your working life. How do you begin to prepare for making such monumental decisions? How can we recognize that we are making the right career move? Suddenly the need for spiritual light in making our decisions becomes very real. Do you see the value of having the Spirit help as you plot your course through life, 
challenges and decisions. The Latter-day Saint hymn, The Iron Rod, illustrates beautifully the vision of Lehi as found in the Book of Mormon. Its message for us is to hold to the rod, the iron rod, or as we know, the Word of God, and it will safely guide us on life's journey. You will recall that in that vision, Lehi saw many people in a great and spacious building mocking and painting their fi- pointing their fingers at those who had arrived to partake of the fruit. Some recipients of this mocking even fell away and became lost. Many in the world today would have you believe that God's word plays no part in your educational process. They scoff at their, your religious standards and beliefs. Some would even have you believe that you cannot reconcile your faith with your educational knowledge and that, and that they are somehow incompatible, inappropriate, and no right-thinking man or woman would believe that sort of thing anymore. We know, however, that this is foolishness. The history of this world is replete with stories of man's disregard for his creator, which disregard leads to his subsequent demise. By obtaining now both spiritual and educational preparation, you are acquiring for yourself and your family or future family the knowledge you will need to provide both spiritual and temporal pillars during your mortal probation here on earth. In the October 1995 General Conference, Elder Richard G. Scott said, The Lord's plan is to exalt you to live with Him and be greatly blessed. The rate at which you qualify is generally set by your capacity to mature, to grow, to love, and to give of yourself. Close quote. The prophet Alma taught his son Helaman a great principle. He said, O remember my son, and learn wisdom in thy youth. Yea, learn in thy youth to keep the commandments of God. By keeping the commandments of God, you will have a greater understanding and enjoy many blessings, which include, one, gaining the necessary secular knowledge needed to win employment that will provide for the temporal needs of your family. Two, enjoy a greater understanding of your potential. Three, having the companionship of the Holy Ghost to influence your decisions. And four, obtaining a promise of protection from the influence of the evil one. And of course, gaining the wisdom and knowledge needed to prepare you for the eternities. In 1971, Elder Dallin H. Oak said at Brigham Young University, we are concerned with the teaching of fundamentals of spiritual and secular knowledge and with bringing those teachings into harmony in the lives of men and women in order to prepare them for a balanced and full life of service to God and fellow man. Close quote. He added some thoughts and goals that we need to pay special attention to in our preparation. He said, one rigorous standards and high achievement in any field of learning are not at odds with the faith and devotion to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Two, strive for excellence. Use the talents the Lord has given you. Meet and master the learning of man. Three, in approaching any field of learning, remember the Lord's direction to seek learning, even by study and also by faith. And four, cherish and nurture your spiritual life. Seek spiritual growth at the same time you are seeking to enlarge your learning in other areas. Nourish your spirit just as regularly as you nourish your body or mind. Don't neglect study of the gospel and activity in the church during the period of your schooling. Close quote. Sometimes we can be so caught up with worldly distractions, a current situation or difficulty, that we fail to realize the answers to many of life's problems are already within our reach. President David O. McKay referred to William George Jordan, who tells the story of some men in a ship, which during a terrific storm was driven far out off its course, and helpless and disabled was carried into a strange bay. The water supply gave out, and the crew suffered the agony of thirst, yet dared not drink of the salt water in which the vessel floated. In the last extremity, they lowered a bucket over the ship's side and in desperation quaffed the beverage they thought was seawater. But to their joy and amazement, the water was fresh, cool, and life-giving. 
they were in a freshwater arm of the sea that they, and they did not know it. They had simply to reach down and accept the new life and strength for which they craved. President McKay then added, the illustration is applicable to a large part of mankind today. Men and nations are drifting. They have lost their bearings. Their wisdom is baffled. Tried and true methods of the past have been discarded and vague and indefinite theories offered as panaceas for social and economic ills. There is an inescapable necessity for a safe and experienced pilot at the wheel. As Latter-day Saints, we should realize that just gaining a college education is not enough to guarantee our success in a changing world. Our preparation for the future must be founded upon principles of the gospel and not on those of the world. Never in the history of this earth has a group of students had to face the turmoil and wickedness that is so pervasive today. The Apostle Paul, when he, <clears throat> when he was incarcerated in the dungeons of Rome, prior to being martyred as a Christian and a follower of Christ, wrote a letter to his friend and protege, Timothy, wherein he described the last days or, of, or the permissive society in which we live today. Quote, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, bolsters, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, end quote. As you continue your education, it is very important that you do not become one of those who Paul described as ever learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Isn't that a most accurate description of life on earth for many people today? President Dwight D. Eisenhower had interesting insight into the importance of spiritual and moral strength. One evening, he had a few close friends at the White House in Washington, D.C. They were discussing world problems. For a long while, the president listened. Then he said, My friends, the biggest, most powerful weapon in the world is not the atomic bomb or even the fighting ability of men. It is their moral and spiritual strength. Nothing can ever conquer that strength. Remember this, gentlemen, because that is the weapon our enemies really fear." End quote. We must never lose sight of the fact that this life is a probationary period, and that by combining our knowledge, both spiritual and secular, with holding to the rod, we can be the recipients of many great and wonderful blessings. The Apostle Paul taught the Corinthians that I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. How do we show the Lord that we love him? He taught us this, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Just as we need to prepare for our life, so also do we need to live our lives in such a way that we will be prepared for the next life. Elder Sterling W. Seals said in the October 1965 General Conference, We can imagine some wonderful things, but we cannot even conceive of that magnificent experience that lies beyond the borders of this life. Certainly the greatest wonders of the future will not be in the improvement of our television, our computers, or our airplanes. They will be primarily in ourselves. The greater the understanding of our own future, the more effectively we will be able to prepare for it. Brigham Young said, prepare to die is not the exhortation of this church, but prepare to live is the word with us and improve all we can in the life hereafter, wherein we may, be, we may enjoy a more exalted condition of intelligence, wisdom, light, knowledge, power, glory, and exaltation. <clears throat> When asked the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life, the Savior responded by saying, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. We show our Heavenly Father and our neighbors how much we love them by the way we serve them. 
The prophet Alma explains that baptism requires that we bear one another's burden, that we may be light, yea, and are willing to mourn with those that mourn, yea, and comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and to stand as witnesses of God at all times. If we learn and remember that charity is the pure love of Christ, we will be able to bless the lives of all those with whom we associate. For charity does suffereth long, and is kind, and envieth not, and is not puffed up, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, and rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. As we prepare for our future, we need to make sure that our secular interests don't distract us from the, or take priority over the spiritual ones. The Lord has taught us to lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So many people have their hearts set upon the things of this world. It is as if wealth and material possessions have become gods whom they worship. Man's never-ending quest for ever more possessions and affluence has in many cases squeezed out feelings of kindness and benevolence towards the poor and the needy. Elder Delbert A. Stapley offered this counsel in the October 1967 General Conference. He whose every act has fitted him for the enjoyment of eternity will be far in advance of the man whose all has been centered on the things of this life. Close quote. Latter-day Saints preparing for a successful future need to remember that selfishness must always be recognized and immediately replaced by selflessness. Elder Dallin H. Oak tells the apocryphal story of two men standing before the casket of a wealthy friend. Asked the one, how much property did he leave? Replied the other, he left all of it. Now in closing, I want to share with you the story of a man who lost his sense of priorities at an early age. President Hugh B. Brown, as a young soldier in World War I, was visiting an elderly friend in the hospital. The friend was a millionaire several times over who, at the age of 80, was lying at death's door. Neither his divorced wife nor any of his five children cared enough to come to the hospital to see him. As President Brown thought of the things his friend had lost, which money could not buy, and noted his tragic situation and the depth of his misery, he asked his friend how he would change the course of his life if he had to live it over again. The old gentleman, who died a few days later, said, As I think back over the life, the most important and valuable asset which I might have had, but which I lost in the process of accumulating my millions, was the simple faith my mother had in God and the immortality of the soul. You ask me what is the most valuable thing in life? I cannot answer you better than those used by the poet. He asked President Brown to get a little book out of his briefcase, from which he read a poem entitled, I'm an Alien. I'm an alien to the faith my mother taught me. I'm a stranger to the God that heard my mother when she cried. I'm an alien to the comfort that now I lay me, brought me, to the everlasting arms that held my father when he died. When the great world came and called me, I deserted all to follow. Never noting in my blindness I had slipped my hand from his, never dreaming in my dazedness that the bubble fame is hollow, that the wealth of gold is tinsel since I have learned it is. I have spent a lifetime seeking things I spurned when I found them. I have fought and been rewarded in many a winning cause, but I'd give it all, fame and fortune, and the pleasures that surround them, if I only had the faith that made my mother what she was. President Brown then stated, that was the dying testimony of a man who was born in the church, but who had drifted far from it. That was a broken-hearted cry of a lonely man who could have anything money could buy, who, but who had lost the most important things in life in order to accumulate this world's goods. 
may we not follow this example. We are led by a prophet of God who gives us the direction we need in order to focus our preparation. We understand that as we strive for excellence in our secular lives, we can balance our efforts with our own spiritual quest to be more like the Master, even Jesus Christ. President Thomas S. Monson taught, before we can successfully undertake a personal search for Jesus, we must first prepare time for him in our lives and room for him in our hearts. In these busy days, there are many who have time for golf, time for shopping, time for work, time for play, but no time for Christ. Lovely homes dot the land and provide rooms for eating, rooms for sleeping, playrooms, sewing rooms, television rooms, but no room for Christ. Close quote. Remember, my young friends, to cry unto the God for all thy support. Yea, let all thy doings be unto the Lord, and whithersoever thou goest, let it be in the Lord. Yea, let all thy thoughts be directed unto the Lord. Yea, let the affections of thy heart be placed upon the Lord forever. Counsel with the Lord in all thy doings, and he will direct thee for good. Yea, when thou liest down at night, lie down unto the Lord, that he may watch over you in your sleep. And when you riseth in the morning, let thy heart be full of thanks unto God. As we meet today in this marvelous center of learning and study, <clears throat> let us realize the necessity of harnessing our secular preparation to a firm spiritual base. Let us now press forward with listening ears, ready to show charity and kindness to those we meet. Let us, as President Harold B. Lee once cautioned, avoid being in the thick of thin things. We should make sure we achieve the very best in our academic life, but recognize that our spiritual preparation will contribute to those achievements and give us peace throughout life and the eternities. And as we do these things, we shall be lifted up at the last days. In conclusion, as I look at you outstanding young men and women here at Brigham Young University today, the future seems very positive and bright for young people who, the love, who love the Lord. You radiate, a wonderful, you radiate a wonderful spirit which I feel from you today. Yes, I believe that Latter-day Saints everywhere can reap the blessings of being well prepared. I bear my witness and testimony to each of you who are here in this assembly today that the church to which you and I belong is the true and living church upon the face of the earth, even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Sister Banks and I recently had the occasion to spend a couple of hours alone, walking hand in hand through the sacred grove. I testify to you that the Prophet Joseph saw what he said he saw as the Father and the Son appeared to him in that sacred ground of the holy sacred grove. And with those seven words as the Father addressed his Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, this is my beloved Son, hear him. But the gospel was reintroduced to the earth through the prophet Joseph, never to be taken from the earth again in its fullness. I testify that the prophet Joseph was the prophet of this dispensation, and the day you and I have the opportunity of sitting and listening to a living prophet today, even President Gordon B. Hinckley, who holds all the keys of the kingdom and promise that if we will listen to his counsel, he will help us to prepare one day to be worthy to return to the presence of the Father and the Son. I testify that God lives and Jesus is the Christ. I try to comprehend the great love that our Father in heaven must have had for us, that he allowed his only begotten Son in the flesh and the firstborn of the Spirit to come to this earth and be offered as a sacrifice for you and for me and all mankind. I try to comprehend the great love that our Lord and Savior, even Jesus Christ, has for us, that he would be willing to take upon himself the sins of all mankind and suffer the persecutions, the torment, and the ridicule that no mortal man could endure 
because of his great love for us. As our Savior and Redeemer, as he fulfilled the atonement and the resurrection that makes it possible for all of us to live again. May we so prepare our lives, my young friends, that one day we will have that glorious opportunity of sitting in the presence of the Father and his Son, our, Jesus, our Savior, Jesus Christ, of which I testify and pray his blessings upon you in his holy name, even Jesus Christ. Amen.